Today we're going to learn about the horrible totalitarian Persians and the saintly, democracy-loving Greeks. But of course, we already know this story. There were some wars in which no one wore any shirts and everyone was reasonably fit. The Persians were bad, the Greeks were good, Socrates and Plato are awesome, the Persians didn't even philosophize. The West is the best! Go team! Yeah, well, no. Let's start with the Persian Empire, which became the model for pretty much all land-based empires throughout the world, except for, wait for it, the Mongols. Much of what we know about the Persians and their empire comes from an outsider writing about them, which is something we now call history. And one of the first true historians was Herodotus, whose famous book, The Persian Wars, talks about the Persians quite a bit. Now, the fact that Herodotus was Greek is important because it introduces us to the idea of historical bias, but more on that in a second. So the Persian Achaemenid dynasty, Achaemenid? Hold on. Achaemenid or Achaemenid. They're both right? I was right twice? Right, so the Persian Achaemenid or Achaemenid dynasty was founded in 539 BCE by King Cyrus the Great. Cyrus took his nomadic warriors and conquered most of Mesopotamia, including the Babylonians, which ended a sad period in Jewish history called the Babylonian Exile, thus ensuring that Cyrus got great press in the Bible. But his son Darius I was even greater. He extended Persian control east to our old friend the Indus Valley, west to our new friend Egypt, and north to crash course newcomer Anatolia. By the way, there were Greeks in Anatolia called Ionian Greeks who will become relevant shortly. So even if you weren't Persian, the Persian Empire was pretty dreamy. For one thing, the Persians ruled with a light touch, like conquered kingdoms were allowed to keep their kings and their elites as long as they pledged allegiance to the Persian king and paid taxes, which is why the Persian king was known as the king of kings. Plus, taxes weren't too high, and the Persians improved infrastructure with better roads, and they had this Pony Express-like mail service, of which Herodotus said, They are stayed neither by snow, nor rain, nor heat, nor darkness, from accomplishing their appointed course with all speed. And the Persians embraced freedom of religion, like they were Zoroastrian, which has a claim to be the world's first monotheistic religion. It was really Zoroastrianism that introduced us to the good, evil dualism we all know so well. You know, God and Satan, or Harry and Voldemort. But the Persians weren't very concerned about converting people of the empire to their faith. Plus, Zoroastrianism forbids slavery, and so slavery was almost unheard of in the Persian Empire. All in all, if you had to live in the 5th century BCE, the Persian Empire was probably the best place to do it. Unless, that is, you believe Herodotus and the Greeks. We all know about the Greeks. Architecture, philosophy, literature. The very word music comes from Greek, as does so much else in contemporary culture. Greek poets and mathematicians and architects and philosophers founded a culture that we still identify with, and they introduced us to many ideas, from democracy to fart jokes. And the Greeks gave the West our first dedicated history. They gave us our vocabulary for talking about politics. Plus, they gifted us our idealization of democracy, which comes from the government they had in Athens. Mr. Green, it's time for the open letter? Really? Already? All right. An open letter, Stan, to Aristophanes. Dear Aristophanes, oh, right, I have to check the secret compartment. Stan, what? Oh. Thank you, Stan. It's fake dog poo. How thoughtful. So good news and bad news, Aristophanes. 2,300 years after your death, this is the good news. You're still reasonably famous. Only 11 of your 40 plays survived. But even so, you're called the father of comedy. There are scholars devoted to your work. Now the bad news. Even though your plays are exceptionally well translated and absolutely hilarious, students don't like to read them in schools. They're always like, why do we got to read this boring crap? And this must be particularly galling to you because so much of what you did in your career was make fun of boring crap, specifically in the form of theatrical tragedies. Plus, you frequently used actual crap to make jokes. Such as when you had the chorus in the Acarnians imagining a character in your play throwing crap at a real poet you didn't like. You, Aristophanes, who wrote that under every stone works a politician who called wealth the most excellent of all the gods. You, who are responsible for the following conversation. I want all to have a share of everything and everything to be in common. There will no longer be rich or poor. I shall begin by making land, money, everything that is private property common to all. But who will till the soil? The slaves. No. Oh. And yet you're seen as homework, drudgery. That, my friend, is a true tragedy. On the upside, we did take care of slavery. It only took us 2,000 years. Best wishes. John Green. When we think about the high point of Greek culture, exemplified by the Parthenon and the plays of Aeschylus, what we're really thinking about is Athens in the 4th century BCE, right after the Persian Wars. But Greece was way more than Athens. Greeks lived in city-states, which consisted of a city and its surrounding area. Most of these city-states featured at least some form of slavery, and in all of them, citizenship was limited to males. 
Sorry, ladies. Also, each of these city-states had its own form of government, ranging from very democratic, unless you were a woman or a slave, to completely dictatorial. And the people who lived in these cities considered themselves citizens of that city, not of anything that would ever be called Greece at least until the Persian Wars. So between 490 and 480 BCE, the Persians made war on the Greek city-states. This was the war that featured the Battle of Thermopylae, where 300 brave Spartans battled, if you believe Herodotus, 5 million Persians, and also the Battle of Marathon, which is a plain about 26.2 miles away from Athens. The whole war started because Athens supported those aforementioned Ionian Greeks when they were rebelling in Anatolia against the Persians. That made the Persian king Xerxes mad, so he led two major campaigns against the Athenians, and the Athenians enlisted the help of all the other Greek city-states. In the wake of that shared Greek victory, the Greeks began to see themselves as Greeks rather than as Spartans or Athenians or whatever. And then Athens emerged as the de facto capital of Greece and then got to experience a golden age, which is something that historians make up. But a lot of things did happen during the golden age, including the Parthenon, a temple that became a church and then a mosque and then an armory until finally settling into its current gig as a ruin. You also had statesmen like Pericles, whose famous funeral oration brags about the golden democracy of Athens with rhetoric that wouldn't sound out of place today. If we look to the laws, they afford equal justice to all in their private differences. If a man is able to serve the state, he is not hindered by the obscurity of his condition. And when you combine that high-minded rhetoric with the undeniable power and beauty of the art and philosophy that was created in ancient Athens, it's not hard to see it as the foundation of Western civilization. And if you buy into this, you have to be glad that the Greeks won the Persian Wars. But even if you put aside the slavery and other injustices in Greek society, there's still trouble. Do I have to say it? Seriously? Fine. Trouble. Right here in River City with a capital T and that rhymes with P and that stands for Peloponnese. Pericles' funeral oration comes from a later war, the Peloponnesian War, which was a 30-year conflict between the Athenians and the Spartans. The Spartans did not embrace democracy, but instead embraced a kingship that functioned only because of a huge class of brutally mistreated slaves. But to be clear, the war was not about Athens trying to get Sparta to embrace democratic reform. Wars rarely are. It was about resources and power. And the Athenians were hardly saintly in all of this, as evidenced by the famous Melian Dialogue. Let's go to the Thought Bubble. So in one of the most famous passages of Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian War, the Athenians sailed to the island of Melos, a Spartan colony and demanded that the Melians submit to Athenian rule. The Melians pointed out that they'd never actually fought with the Spartans and were like, listen, if it's all the same to you, we'd like to go Switzerland on this one. Except, of course, they didn't say that because there was no Switzerland, to which the Athenians responded, and here I am quoting directly, the strong do what they can and the weak suffer what they must. And needless to say, this is not a terribly democratic or enlightened position to take. This statement, in fact, is sometimes seen as the first explicit endorsement of the so-called theory of realism in international relations. For realists, interaction between nations or peoples or cultures is all about who has the power. Whoever has it can compel whoever doesn't have it to do pretty much anything. So what did the meritocratic and democratic Athenians do when the Melians politely asked not to participate in the fight? They killed all the Melian men and enslaved all the women and children. So yes, Socrates gave us his interrogative method, Sophocles gave us Oedipus, but the legacy of ancient Greece is profoundly ambiguous. All the more so because the final winner of the Peloponnesian War were the dictatorial Spartans. Thanks for the incredible bummer, Thought Bubble. So here's a non-rhetorical question. Did the right side win the Persian Wars? Most classicists and defenders of the Western tradition will tell you that, of course, we should be glad the Greeks won. After all, winning the Persian Wars set off the cultural flourishing that gave us the classical age. And plus, if the Persians had won with their monarchy, they might have strangled democracy in its crib and gave us more one-man rule. And that's possible. But as a counter to that argument, let's consider three things. First, it's worth remembering that life under the Persians was pretty good, and if you look at the last 5,000 years of human history, you'll find a lot more successful and stable empires than you will democracies. Second, life under the Athenians wasn't so awesome, particularly if you were a woman or a slave, and their government was notoriously corrupt. And ultimately, the Athenian government derived its power not from its citizens, but from the imperialist belief that might makes right. It's true that Athens gave us Socrates, but let me remind you, they also killed him.
Well, I mean, they forced him to commit suicide. Whatever, Herodotus, you're not the only one here who can engage in historical bias. And lastly, under Persian rule, the Greeks might have avoided the Peloponnesian War, which ended up weakening the Greek city-states so much that Alexander, coming soon, the great's father, was able to conquer all of them, and then there were a bunch of bloody wars with the Persians, and all kinds of horrible things, and Greece wouldn't glimpse democracy again for two millennia, all of which might have been avoided if they had just let themselves get beaten by the Persians. All of which forces us to return to the core question of human history. What's the point of being alive? Should we try to ensure the longest, healthiest, and most productive lives for humans? If so, it's easy to argue that Greece should have lost the Persian Wars. But perhaps lives are supposed to be lived in pursuit of some great ideal worth sacrificing endlessly for. And if so, maybe the glory of Athens still shines, however dimly. Those are the real questions of history. What's the point of being alive? How should we organize ourselves? What should we seek from this life? Those aren't easy questions, but We'll take another crack at them next week when we talk about the Buddha. I'll see you then. Hi, I'm John Green. This is Crash Course World History, and apparently it's Revolutions Month here at Crash Course because today we are going to discuss the oft-neglected Haitian Revolution. So the French colony in Saint-Domingue began in the 17th century as a pirate outpost. And its original French inhabitants made their living selling leather and a kind of smoked beef called boucan. All that beef actually came from cattle left behind by the Spanish, who were the first Europeans to settle the island. But anyway, after 1640, the boucan sellers started to run low on beef. And they were like, you know what would pay better than selling beef jerky? robbing Spanish galleons, which, as you'll recall, were loaded with silver mined from South America. So by the middle of the 17th century, the French had convinced many of those buccaneering captains to give up their pirating and settle on the island. Many of them invested some of their pirate treasure in sugar plantations, which by 1700 were thriving at both producing sugar and working people to death. And soon, this island was the most valuable colony in the West Indies and possibly in the world. It produced 40% of Europe's sugar, 60% of its coffee, and it was home to more slaves than any place except Brazil, and as you'll recall from our discussion of Atlantic slavery, being a slave in a sugar production colony was exceptionally brutal. In fact, by the late 18th century, more slaves were imported to San Domingue every year, more than 40,000, than the entire white population of the island. By the 19th century, slaves made up about 90% of the population, and most of those slaves were African-born because the brutal living and working conditions prevented natural population growth. Like, remember Alfred Crosby's fantastic line, it is crudely true that if man's caloric intake is sufficient, he will somehow stagger to maturity and he will reproduce? Yeah, well, not in 18th century Haiti, thanks to yellow fever and smallpox and just miserable working conditions. So most of these plantations were pretty large. They often had more than 200 slaves, and many of the field workers, in some cases a majority, were women. Colonial society in San Domingo was divided into four groups, which had important consequences for the revolution. At the top were the big white planters who owned the plantations and all the slaves. Often these Grand Blancs were absentee landlords who would just rather stay in France and let their agents do, you know, the actual brutality. Below them were the wealthy free people of color. Most of the Frenchmen who came to the island were, you know, men, and they frequently fathered children with slave women. These fathers would often free their children. Wasn't that generous of them. So by 1789, there were 24,800 free people of color, along with about 30,000 white people in the colony. The free people of color contributed a lot to the island's stability. They served in the militia and in the local constabulary, and many of the wealthier ones eventually owned plantations and slaves of their own. And then below them on the social ladder were the poor whites, or the petite blonde who worked as artisans and laborers. And at the bottom were the slaves, who made up the overwhelming majority. I know what you're thinking. This is a recipe for permanent social stability. No, it wasn't. Okay, so when the French Revolution broke out in 1789, all these groups had something to complain about. The slaves obviously disliked being slaves. The free people of color were still subject to legal discrimination, no matter how wealthy they became. And the poor whites, in addition to being poor, were resentful of all the privileges held by the wealthy people of color. And the Grand Blancs were complaining about French trade laws and the government's attempts to slightly improve the living and working conditions of slaves. Basically, they were saying that government shouldn't be in the business of regulating business. So everyone was unhappy, but the slaves were by far the worst off. Mr. Green, Mr. Green, you're always saying how much slavery sucks, but is it really any worse than having to work for, like, subsistence? Yeah, I'm gonna stop you right there, me from the past, before you further embarrass yourself. You often hear from people attempting to comprehend the horrors of slavery that slavery couldn't have been all that bad, and that it wasn't that different from working for minimum wage. And that we know this because if it had been so bad, slaves would 
would have just revolted, which they never did. Yeah, well, one, equating slavery to poor working conditions ignores the fact that if you work at, like, Foxconn, Foxconn doesn't get to sell your children to other corporations. And two, as you're about to see, slaves did revolt. So the unrest in what became Haiti started in 1789 when some slaves heard a rumor that the king of France had freed them. Even though it was across the ocean, word of the changes in France reached the people of Haiti, where the Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen, while terrifying to planters, gave hope both to free people of color and to slaves. At the same time, some petite blancs argued that there was inadequate discrimination against blacks. They identified with the third estate in France, and they called for interest rates to be lowered so they could more easily pay their debts. And they began lobbying for colonial independence. The psychology here shows you the extent to which slaves were not considered people. I mean, these radical petite blancs thought that they were the oppressed people in San Domingo because they couldn't afford to own slaves. And they thought if they could become independent from France, they could take power from the people of privilege and institute a democracy where everyone had a voice, except for the 95% of people who weren't white. Then, in 1791, these radical petite blancs seized the city of Port-au-Prince. You'll remember that by 1791, France was at war with most of Europe. And just like with the Seven Years' War, the wars of revolutionary France played out in the colonies as well as at home. So the French government sent troops to San Domingo. Meanwhile, urges toward liberty, fraternity, and equality were only growing in France, and it didn't seem very equitable to grant citizenship based solely on race. So in May of 1791, the National Assembly gave full French citizenship to all free men of color. I mean, if they owned property and had enough money and weren't the children of slaves. The Petite Blancs weren't thrilled about this, and that led to fighting breaking out between them and the newly French free people of color. And then in August of 1791, the slaves were like, um, hi, yes, screw all of you and a massive slave revolt broke out. Among the leaders of this revolt was Toussaint Breda, a former slave of full African descent who later took the name Toussaint Louverture. Louverture helped mold the slaves into a disciplined army that could withstand attacks from the French troops. But again, the context of the wider revolution proves really important here. So the Spanish had consistently supported slave revolts in San Domingo, hoping to weaken the French, but by 1793, they were offering even more support. In fact, Louverture became an officer in the Spanish military because the emancipation of the slaves was more important to him than maintaining his rights as a French citizen. So then in October of 1793, the British, whom as I'm sure you'll recall were also at war with France, decided to invade San Domingo. And at that point, the French military commanders were like, we are definitely going to lose this war if we fight the British, the Spanish, and the slaves, so let's free the slaves. So they issued decrees freeing the slaves, and on February 4th, 1794, the National Convention in Paris ratified those decrees. By May, having learned of the convention's actions, Louverture switched allegiances to the French and turned the tide of the war. Thus, the most successful slave revolt in human history won freedom and citizenship for every slave in the French Caribbean. But emancipation didn't end the story because the French were still at war with the Spanish and the English in San Domingo. Luckily for France, Louverture was an excellent general, and luckily for the people of the island, Louverture was also an able politician, and between 1794 and 1802, he successfully steered the colony toward independence. So although slavery was abolished, this didn't end the plantation system, because both Louverture and his compatriot André Rigaud believed that sugar was vital to the economic health of the island. But now at least people were paid for their labor and their kids couldn't be sold, now you can compare it to Foxconn. But soon Louverture and Rigaud came into conflict over Rigaud's refusal to give up control over one of the southern states on the island, and there was a civil war, which Louverture, with the help of his able lieutenant Jacques Dessalines, was able to win after 13 months of hard fighting. Louverture then passed a new constitution, and things were going pretty well on San Domingo, with the small problem that it was still technically part of France, which meant that it was about to be ruled by Napoleon Bonaparte. Let's go to the Thought Bubble. So in 1799, Napoleon seized power in France in a coup, and his new regime, called the Consulate, because he was the first consul, a la the Roman Republic, established a new constitution that specifically pointed out its laws did not apply to France's overseas colonies. Napoleon had plans to reconstruct France's empire in North America that it had lost most of during the Seven Years' War, and to do this, he needed tons of money from France's most valuable colony, San Domingo. And the best way to maximize profits? Why to reintroduce slavery, of course. That's certainly what the former slaves thought was the plan when in 1802, a French expedition commanded by Napoleon's brother-in-law, Charles Victor Emmanuel, I have too many names, Leclerc, showed up in San Domingo. This started the second phase of the Haitian Revolution, the fight for independence. So Leclerc eventually had Louverture arrested and shipped to France, where he died in prison in 1803, but this itself did not spark an uprising against the French, because Louverture wasn't actually that popular, largely because he wanted most black 
blacks on the island to continue to grow sugar. Instead, the former slaves only started fighting when Leclerc tried to take away their guns, thus beginning a guerrilla war that the French, despite their superior training and weapons, had absolutely no chance of winning. Although the French were exceedingly cruel, executing women as well as men and importing man-eating dogs from Cuba, the Haitians had the best ally of all disease, specifically in the form of yellow fever, which killed thousands of French soldiers, including Leclerc himself. So continued defeat and the death of his troops eventually convinced Napoleon to give up his dreams of an American empire and cut his losses. He recalled all his surviving troops of the 40,000 who left, only 8,000 made it back, and then he sold Thomas Jefferson, Louisiana. And that is how former slaves in Haiti gave America all of this. On January 1st, 1804, Dessalines, who had defeated the French, declared the island of San Domingue independent and renamed it Haiti, which is what the island had been called by native inhabitants before the arrival of Columbus. The Haitian Declaration of Independence was a rejection of France and to a certain degree of European racism and colonialism. It also affirmed, to quote from the book Slave Revolution in the Caribbean, a broad definition of the new country as a refuge for enslaved peoples of all kinds. So why is this little island so important that we would devote an entire episode to it. First, Haiti was the second free and independent nation-state in the Americas. It also had one of the most successful slave revolts ever. Haiti became the first modern nation to be governed by people of African descent, and they also foiled Napoleon's attempts to build a big New World Empire. Of course, Haiti's history since its revolution has been marred by tragedy, a legacy of the loss of life that accompanied the revolution. I mean, 150,000 people died in 1802 and 1803 alone. But the Haitian revolutions matter. They matter because the Haitians, more than any other people in the age of revolutions stood up for the idea that none should be slaves, that the people who most need the protection of a government should be afforded that protection. Haiti stood up for the weak when the rest of the world failed to. The next time you read about Haiti's poverty, remember that. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next week.